All right, so we're going to be doing the first Opium War, which I don't know too much about. Like, I'm vaguely aware of. It's kind of on the peripheral of some historical events that I am aware of. Like, it gets mentioned in some books that I've read, but more as kind of like a side note. Um, I believe this is sort of a story of uh, British imperialism. Uh, it, it's not really an Eastern history or a western history it's an imperial history it's sort of global in that sense so that's fun um i wonder if uh, my stream's been demonetized yet for having opium in the uh in the title honestly it doesn't take much to get the stream demonetized it probably already has been i'm gonna have to appeal that when we're done with this um I i've already decided that it's happened isn't that fun uh, so here we have the first Opium War. I think Hong Kong is tied into this. I believe. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it's... Because the British ended up controlling Hong Kong for like the longest time. We talked about that uh, in previous weeks. Uh, so I, I think that's something that ties into the Opium War. Uh, other than that, I'm not entirely sure where this is going to go. Uh... We get to learn a little bit more about uh, imperialism. Let's see what happens. 1792. Britain has just come out of a war that's cost it not only much of its national treasury, but also one of its most lucrative overseas colonies, North America. The empire needs new sources of revenue, new opportunities for trade, and there's one clear possibility. China. Hmm. By the end of the 18th century, the world had become a much smaller place, with European traders traveling the globe to feed the hungry markets of the industrializing West. Wars were fought all over the planet to secure exotic goods or the raw materials needed to power new economies of the rising European empires. But China still remained aloof. Demand for Chinese goods was high. Silk, porcelain, and especially tea were coveted by buyers back in Europe. But the Chinese emperors saw all these foreign traders as a potentially destabilizing influence, and as they had done throughout Chinese history, placed strict controls on foreign trade. Sp Isn't this kind of interesting to have, like, things flipped a little bit? I, it's not like forced trade or whatever. It's, it's not going to have, like, the same element there. But today, uh, China is on the other side of this, where they are one of the uh, larger... Largest? I, I don't know where exactly they fall, but they are one of the largest uh, exporters uh, when it comes to foreign trade. So that's kind of fascinating how far we've come or risen or fallen. I, I, I don't know. It depends how you look at it. Specifically, they, they make money. Just a few ports. Traders weren't allowed to set foot in the empire except at a handful of cities designated for that purpose. And all trade had to go through a trade monopoly known as the Hong, who could tax and regulate foreign trade as they saw fit. By the middle of the 18th century, this was taken further, and all foreign trade was restricted to a single port, Canton. This drove resentment among the European traders who saw limitless opportunity for profit if they could just get their hands on it. And mm -hmm. these Europeans trading in China were, in some ways, a self-selecting group. If you're going to make your living transporting goods thousands of miles from your home, you probably believe in the inherent value of unrestricted trade, which meant mm. that these rules did not sit well with the Europeans, and piracy and smuggling began to rise. Even within the official channels of trade, As it does. began to strain at these limitations. Eventually, and it How are the Dutch doing during this time? This is usually like one of those situations where the, uh, the Dutch are able to, like when it comes to foreign trade, the Dutch are always the ones who are kind of like ahead of the game on stuff. So I, I'm curious to, if they've touched upon this region yet. They, they must have. An employee of the Honorable East India Company, the militarized trade organization responsible for British affairs in India, pushed mm. by what he saw as abuses of corrupt officials and undue restrictions on free trade, decided that it was time to openly break the rules that the Chinese imposed. He left Canton and took his grievances upriver, literally and figuratively, wanting to be heard by someone in the Chinese hierarchy who was outside the Hong, outside the monopoly set up in Canton. And here's where divides of culture come in. Because it's possible that he wasn't acting in a way that he saw as malicious or even inappropriate. In fact, he may have been acting in a way that he thought of as perfectly reasonable were he in England. 
but he wasn't mm. in England. And the arrogance of this traitor just deciding that his complaints should be elevated to imperial court rather than going through the proper authorities was unbelievable to the Chinese. <laughs> More than that, it put into question- The hubrist of the wet the hubrist? Hubrist. The hubris of the West. We, we, that is how it, it do be. The Dutch have their resources in Indonesia and limited trade in China and Japan. Okay. Uh, uh the Dutch can, uh, okay. Like that, that's, I was curious about that because the, the Dutch are fascinating when you're talking about foreign trade. Uh, the British were like one of the strongest empires in the world, but the Dutch had a very sophisticated approach to trade. So I like seeing how they handle similar situations. Question whether these Europeans would stay in one port at all or even obey Chinese law. And so further restrictions were put into place. Trade was clamped down on even more. But European demands for Chinese goods, especially English demands for their newfound love of black tea, continued to grow. Which brings us back to 1792. By this point, the British were importing tens of millions of pounds of tea every year. Within two decades, import duties on tea would account for 10% of the government's entire revenue. Tea was one of the major drivers of the economy. Tea was so essential to the British world that the Canton system was simply no longer acceptable. And more than that, the British were now running an enormous trade deficit with the Chinese. Millions of pounds of silver were flowing out of the British Empire and into China. On top of that, recent European struggles had cut them off from the silver mines of South America, mm. and costly foreign wars had left the treasury dry. Even the Honorable East... Oh yeah, like the, the issue of the time, the common issue of like lack of hard currency. There's a lot of... Uh, like when the... Uh, the Spanish went to America. That was one of the big things that they did. They they were there because they wanted hard resources to create new currency. They needed silver. They needed gold, and that uh, like flooded the their market a little bit more. And they were able to actually keep up with that sort of stuff. Um, the British faced similar problems. I'm aware. India Company was broke, incurring a huge debt to finance their military conquests of parts of India. I think. The British Empire, for all of its power and its wealth, for all its global might and territory in every region of the globe, simply did not have the raw currency it needed to continue paying for its tea habit. So, the British decided that it was time to finally send an official diplomatic mission to China. No more traders, merchants, or pirates. This was going to be a pirates. new envoy from one monarch to another to talk about opening up trade. After some consideration, it was decided that the first Earl of McCartney, a seasoned colonial governor, should lead the mission. His aims were simple. End the Canton system, establish a permanent embassy, or at least get a permanent British representative in the imperial court, and, if possible, secure the grant of a small island off the coast of China where British merchants could operate under British rather than Chinese law. So they packed the hold of a ship with clocks and telescopes and even carriages to be presented to the Chinese emperor and began their trip. They sailed east around the Cape of Good Hope, with only one minor detour when the trade hmm. winds pushed them all the way to Rio de Janeiro. At last, though, they arrived in China. They immediately asked to dock at a port much closer to Beijing than Canton. This was considered bad form by the Chinese, but representatives of the East India Company explained that they had expensive gifts for the emperor on board and didn't want any of them to get ruined in a long overland journey, so the Chinese acquiesced. <laughs> their goods were ferried up the Grand Canal to Beijing, and here they assembled their gifts and prepared for the last leg of their journey, over the Great Wall and to the Emperor's Summer Palace at Jahal. Here they finally met the Emperor. And trouble began immediately. Because in of the presence of the Emperor, it was expected that everyone kowtow, or kneel and bow so low oh. that the floor. And McCartney, being a seasoned British governor and gentleman, hailing from what he believed was the most powerful and civilized nation in the world with, as he saw it, the most divine monarch and not only the right but the duty to spread the British way around the globe, refused to do so. Oh gosh, that is... That is a very British thing to do for the time. There is... It's the, the national pride... Uh, the the certainty of one's own superiority, the unwillingness to lower yourself, it, it, it it's a common factor. So, yeah, absolutely, I I, I see that. Um, uh, but like, 
somebody with a little bit more tact would understand that in order to uh, get to a foreign culture, you have to somewhat immerse yourself in it in order to uh, uh, communicate your ideas more effectively. One of my favorite historical figures is uh, Roger Williams, and he spoke to the natives by learning their own language and taking on their customs, and he was far more effective at like converting them to Christianity than any of the people in Massachusetts were. Uh, so... You know, it, it's like I sort of respect the pride in not wanting to bow to other to people who you don't believe are better than you. I kind of respect it. But I don't think it's a very big brain move. After all, if he wasn't going to touch his head to the floor for King George, he certainly wasn't going to do it here. So after some wrangling and protestations, mm -hmm. he proposed a counter solution. He would perform the kowtow so long as, every time it was done, a Chinese official of equal rank would kowtow to a picture of George III. This was, of course, ludicrous to the Chinese, as, after all, they were from the most powerful and civilized nation in the world, with the most divine monarch, and who was this barbarian getting the theme. his king on anything like the emperor's level? Seriously. But even without the kowtow issue truly resolved, with McCartney merely genuflecting in the end, as he would to King George, the meeting went forward. McCart like, it's a little... Like, it's kind of fair. It's kind of not fair. I, I don't know. This is a really delicate situation. Like, I don't like the idea of, uh... of bowing to monarchs in general. But if you... His position is to open trade relations, there is a certain degree of uh, respecting for a foreign culture that you have to do. Like, that, that's kind of the natural thing. Uh, Michael Hill says, uh, Ben Franklin's also a great example. He truly absorbed himself in French culture. Yeah, that, that's the thing. You, well, he kind of absorbed himself in French culture. In a lot of ways, he brought American culture to France. Uh, or he gave them what they thought American culture was, and they kind of admired American culture from a distance. Um, so, like, from the role of any sort of ambassador, there is a certain amount of immersion in the other culture that is absolutely necessary. So it may be good as, like, a free British citizen for him to not, but it's not a good decision as an ambassador. One of those things where like th this is bigger than you this is bigger than the individual Hartney showed off the marvels of british science although mostly the flashier and less practical kind and presented them to the emperor and here too signals got crossed because the chinese court took this as a tribute mission after all all gift giving missions to the emperor are tribute missions what else would it be and yet the british thought that they were demonstrating all the reasons that china would benefit from opening up trade with them so in the end, McCartney was dismissed without the Emperor agreeing to a single one of the goals he set out to achieve. And the Emperor sent one of the most gloriously, imperially snarky letters ever penned to King oh, George, gosh. thanking him I'm for excited. his tribute, which, though neither he nor the Chinese actually wanted it, he would graciously accept out of respect for how far George had sent people just to pay him tribute. But no, China didn't need baubles or knickknacks from England, thank you. Trade would remain the way it was. So Britain was left with a massive trade deficit. The East India Company was 28 million pounds in debt as a result of their war in India, and the royal coffers were nearly dry. They needed to find some product the Chinese wanted. And then they... Okay, here's how we get it. It's always drugs, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, we, we go this route. This is like, uh, I, I use the example of, uh of uh converting american indians because it is a similar thing you're you're uh reaching out to a culture that's uh so very separate from you like what do you bring them that they don't already have and uh alcohol was one of them so in, in a lot of ways and, and it still kind of affects them today there's massive uh, levels of alcoholism on uh on reservations so honestly there's probably more parallels here than i knew that example may have been perfect
Last we left off, the treasury of the British Empire was flowing into China, and the Honorable East India Company was still reeling under the staggering debt it owed the government for underwriting its military conquests in India. Something needed to be done. They needed to find some tradable good, something other than silver, that the Chinese wanted to import to offset the massive costs of the Victorian need for tea, and the- Moral, always learn the culture of your diplomatic partner or potential diplomatic partner. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you don't have to like them. You really don't. But like, you got to accept that this, the symbolism of bowing may have different implications there than it does in your own home. And if you want, it's basically their home, their rules sort of thing. And if, if you can't deal with that, then it's probably not the ideal trading partner. Though I know they're not willing to accept that because they see how profitable this could potentially be. The answer they found was opium. By the early 1800s, tea sales in England were unimaginably high. Given the quantity they were importing, the average English household spent about 5% of its income just on tea. The government itself That's was crazy. By That's insane. Tea. Because the government had lent the Honorable East India Company so much money to conquer parts of India, and because a huge portion of the East India Company's revenue came from transporting tea from China, the country was even more dependent on the tea trade, as that revenue was being used not only to repay the debt the company had incurred, but to pay interest on it. But even as the tea craze was consuming England, the Honorable East India Company was also coming to the realization that their conquests in India weren't realizing the returns they'd hoped. Their plans to grow cotton in India had gone awry as cotton production in the Americas, and especially in Egypt, were on the rise. But it turns out that something else grew really well on all that land that they'd planned to use for cotton. Poppies. So the East India Company found its solution. They would grow poppies in India, convert them into opium, sell that at a profit in China, use the profit to buy tea, Drugs. and sell that at a profit back in Britain. And then we talked about this today. It, you, you find something that would be terrible if people just went off and did it, but you just gotta give it government sanction and it's totally fine. There were only a few problems with this plan. Besides the fact that it meant pushing drugs on an unheard of scale, there was also the issue that opium was technically illegal in China. And the Honorable East India Company, being of course the Honorable East India Company, would never do something illegal. Okay, they would, but they didn't want to risk getting kicked out of China or cut off from its tea. So they set up a market in Calcutta, basically the part of India closest to China that they controlled. And they said, anybody who wants to buy opium, we're selling it right here. No idea what you might want to do with it, but hey, that's not our business. Who wants some opium? Come on. And then they would let the smugglers handle it from there. So now you've got a bunch of dodgy characters selling drugs in the Middle Kingdom, basically backed by the largest corporation and the largest national economy in the world. And, as Indian opium turned out to be even stronger than the domestically grown stuff, everybody wanted it. So opium sales oh, great. skyrocketed. And by 1835, they were moving roughly 3,064,000 pounds of opium per year into China. And that number was only going to get bigger, because in 1833, the British government decided to finally do away with the Honorable East India Company's monopoly on the opium trade. Mm. Now everybody wanted a piece of the action, and opium started flowing into China completely unregulated, increasing supply, driving prices down, and making- That is a product. I'm not surprised that they gave them a, uh... The East India Company has always gotten, like, this sort of, uh, preferential treatment, uh, for- for obvious reasons. Uh, they received an, a monopoly on the tea trade, and now they're receiving an, uh, they received a monopoly on the opium trade. Like, it, I, I don't... I, it, it's so hard to explain the history of the East India Company, because there's so many layers to it, but it, the amount of monopolies they got is insane. And it, it often allowed them to... Like, in the case of tea, it allowed them to sell things... Uh, cheaper, which would probably, if the same effect was had in the opium trade, it probably made it easier to move opium. <laughs> the substance. Let, let, we got to use insider drug trafficking terms for this. I, I just don't know enough of them. Even more accessible. By 1839, nearly 5,639,000 pounds of opium would be pouring into China every year. But I'm getting ahead of myself, because it's not like the Chinese were just sitting around letting this happen. 
as piles of money which the government desperately needed flowed out of the country, the emperor appointed an official named Len Zexu to address Len the Zexu. disastrous effects of opium on the country. He was brilliant, incorruptible, and utterly inflexible. He saw the threat of the West and the morally corrupting effect that opium had had on the Chinese people. Get the West. The only approach to take was the complete removal of opium from China. By March of 1839, he had reached Canton. It was the source of all this opium, so he planned to cut it off at its source. And still, they mostly lost money. <laughs> you are, you are right. The, uh, the, I don't know how. The, uh, I don't know how the East India Company kept failing. It failed a lot, given how much preferential treatment it was given. I, I don't understand. Like, uh, you have a country behind you that's the economic and naval powerhouse that it is, and somehow the, they, they couldn't keep anything together. And they were also constantly being, uh, kind of like the center of conflict in, in the americas i believe pretty heavily in india i don't know as much about it but i, I know that's certainly it and here we are here like they, no, it, it said that they don't have the monopoly here anymore but they're certainly involved his actions were swift and uncompromising. He arrested thousands of Chinese opium traders, forced addicts into rehabilitation programs, confiscated opium pipes, and closed opium dens. And then he took on the Western traders. At first, he wrote an open letter to Queen Victoria, appealing to her conscience, a letter which it's very likely she never received. When he got no reply, he demanded that the foreigners surrender their stores of opium. The foreign merchants stalled and prevaricated, giving up small amounts of their opium stock, but nowhere near what Lin Zexu had demanded. So he marshaled the troops and put the foreign warehouses to siege. The merchants holed up for a month and a half, but in the end they gave in, and were forced to surrender 21,000 chests of opium. For the next 23 days, Zexu burned the opium with lye. This was a king's ransom in opium. The amount of money this destruction represented is staggering. Oh, that... It was roughly one... That's how you start a war with the British there. You, you, you hit them where it hurts. You hit them in the wallet. That's what... That's what led to a lot of the crackdowns in Massachusetts leading up to the American Revolution. We have the uh, Boston Tea Party, which cost them tons of money, uh, along with like the boycotts of British tea going up and down the colonies. Like once you hit them in the in the wallet, they're gonna step in. So I'd imagine this is this is the kicking off point. Sixth as much as the British Empire, the largest, most far flung empire in the world had spent on its military the previous year. Needless to say, everybody involved was going bankrupt. Now, there is some debate over whether the Chinese offered tea in exchange for the surrendered opium, but what is certain is that the merchants never received any tea, and instead the local chief superintendent of British trade, one Captain Charles Elliot, promised the merchants that the British government would cover their losses if they would leave peacefully. Which, of course, the British government absolutely refused to do. <laughs> the outcry over this illegal seizure of British goods began to grow. Meanwhile, back in China, a reprehensible incident occurred where some drunken British sailors beat a man to death. Lin Zexu demanded the execution of a British sailor in recompense. Captain Elliot, who actually disliked the opium trade and was somewhat sympathetic to the Chinese situation, put out a reward for evidence of who had committed the murder and uh -huh. gave money to the victim's family. He then had the criminals tried on his ship, inviting Lin Zexu or a representative to witness the proceedings, although none took him up on the invitation. He sentenced the men to hard labor back in England. But this wouldn't work for Lin Zexu. After all, the whole Zexu. point of his demand was to show that foreigners couldn't just violate Chinese law on Chinese soil. So in response, he stopped all food being supplied to the British and posted signs telling them that frothier water sources had been poisoned. Next, he ordered the Portuguese to eject all British from Macau. He was going to see these pesky British and their drugs off Chinese soil once and for all. So the British retreated to a barren nothing island off the coast a barren nothing island that will eventually be known as Hong Kong. Hey! There we go. Captain Elliot sent a request for food sales to resume. The response was delayed, so he sent men ashore to buy food. But as they were heading back, these provisions were seized by Chinese officials. Soon, a firefight broke out between the blockading Chinese junks and the British ships. And thus began the First Opium War. Like that, I... I love that I'm able to find parallels for this stuff. 
I, I'm not, I don't buy into that history necessarily repeats itself, but the, there are undoubtedly themes in human behavior. So like, if, if you like that term, if you apply it kind of like in a, in a broad sense, it, it, it fits here. <laughs> it totally fits. Uh, though I would say, no, no, not even like it, it works for, especially here because one of the parties uh, being the British has experienced similar things in the past. Uh, so there's something there. All right. Here we go. Guns had been. Fired. I think this is only a four parter unless I missed one. Hope I, I believe it's only a four parter. So it's kind of on the short side when it comes to. Uh, some extra history, that extra history series. So I think we're gonna have a good amount of time, and after this, we're gonna get into some you are there, which I think will be a blast. Lives had been lost, but full-scale war wasn't a certainty yet. The British set up a blockade. The Chinese were offering to let British captains dock so long as they signed a bond saying that they would never sell opium in China and were willing to be subject to Chinese law. But the British had mm. already put out the order. No British ship was to trade with the Chinese. Tensions are high. Oh no. no. Would have to give. Communication. <laughs> On the 3rd of November, 1839. Oh, uh, it does not repeat. It rhymes. Like, that's the, uh... That's it. History does not repeat itself. It rhymes. I believe that quote was, like, attributed to, like, Mark Twain or something. And like, I, I, I think it's like one of those quotes where like we, we might not necessarily know who originally came up with it, but I, I kind of like it. I don't use it too much because every professor I ever had has used it at least once. And I feel like I've heard it to death. <laughs> so that's why I don't use it. But that's just a personal thing. I don't think it's a bad saying. A British ship by the name of the Royal Saxon approached Canton. They were signaled to stop, to turn back, but they made a run for it. One of the British ships in the blockade fired a warning shot. It skipped past their bow. The cannon shot was heard from the shore. The Chinese admiral stationed at Canton made his decision. He would send out his fleet to protect the Royal Saxon. And so a small host of junks and fire ships began to pour out of the Canton harbor. The situation was confused. The commander of the ship that originally fired requested permission to engage. Mm. Captain Elliot, the superintendent of British trade and the man who'd convinced the British merchants to hand over their opium in the first place, initially wavered, but the Chinese ships were bearing down hard. Mm. Another request to engage was made. The At this point, the people who are like in the field are kind of stuck in this conflict. It's kind of hard to pull out. They're sort of victims of the circumstances around them. Like, this conflict seems like it's happening regardless. Chinese ships were festooned with red flags, the color of war. The honor of his nation and his flag would not allow Elliot to back down before such intimidation. The order was given, and the men engaged. The first broadside roared over the water. British shells shredded one of the fire rafts. There was a cataclysmic explosion, a gout of flame and sea. One of the war junk's magazines had been hit. All that was left of it were burning planks carried by the waves. The ships turned to give another broadside, but the outmatched Chinese junks began to retreat. Only the proud admiral's flagship was left, standing defiantly, returning shot. But it was hopelessly outclassed and already damaged. Seeing the admiral standing alone, Elliot told his captains to cease fire. The point had been made, there was no need for meaningless slaughter. And so, seeing the ceasefire, the flagship turned and limped back to port. The first real battle of the Opium Wars had come and passed, with mm. the British bombarding the Chinese forces for defending a British ship which they themselves had originally fired on. For some time after this, there was a lull. Some in China even thought that the British were too far away to seriously pursue a war. But the truth oh, is... Oh, the, the British have experience pursuing wars that are far away. They are capable, especially having like one of the strongest navies in the world if not the strongest navy in the world mustering their forces at that very moment marines and soldiers from india were being redeployed and transported to china the latest ships were dispatched from british naval yards to serve in the fight many in the british admiralty saw this as an excellent opportunity to field test the iron steam and sail ships that were just rolling off the lines when the forces arrived hmm. though the british descended on the island of chusan 
the Chinese Tucson. and British officials met, once on the Chinese flagship, once on the British ship. Each time, the British made their demands clear, surrender the island and no one will be harmed. And each time, the Chinese responded in baffled disbelief. The Chinese officials told the British that hey, the what? never did you any harm. It's not right to punish us for the acts of those in Canton. They implored the British to turn away, but the British had their duty, and as the Chinese officials made clear on their way out, so did going they. down. The next morning, the bombardment began. Soon the Chinese forces retreated behind the walls of their city, and the British Marines landed unopposed. They set up their guns and then took the night to rest. By the next day, they found the city nearly deserted. Chusan had been captured with little loss of life, and the British had a jumping-off point for their operations should they decide to threaten Shanghai. By this point, the Emperor had dismissed Lin Zexu, the righteous minister who he had so celebrated a short while before, and replaced him with an official named Qi Shan, who was in to treat with the British. Qi Shan and Elliot began to discuss a settlement. They haggled over reparation for the destroyed opium, and eventually came to a figure of six million pounds. But Elliot was still supposed to get territory for the British Empire that they could use for a port. He offered to return Chusan in exchange for some other island, but Qi Shen was not about to give away portions of sovereign China. Mm -hmm. And so the talks broke down. Then, as the new year passed, at least for the English, an opium runner, which had snuck its way into Canton, came back with the rumor that the emperor intended to resume the war and attack the British. Elliot decided to preempt such an assault, though the wisdom of trusting unsubstantiated rumors coming from opium runners is a bit questionable. Really, it's unlikely that such an attack was ever actually in the works. But working with the information he had, Elliot commanded the British forces to open fire on the Chinese fortifications at Chuen Pi near Canton on the morning of January 7, 1841. The fighting lasted mere hours. The British guns ripped through the fortifications and silenced any counterbatteries with haste. Then, Indian and British Marines landed and rapidly pushed the Chinese ground forces back. Tragically, a... So the Chinese just didn't know how tough the British were, I guess. This is a sort of, like, I, I was thinking we'd get more uh, British hubris coming into play here, but it seems like the Chinese have uh, underestimated to a great degree what they were dealing with here. Um... Oh, gosh, Rumor it's not going to go well. Among the Chinese that the British I know this is like a terrible conflict, so like I know it's not going to go well. No, nothing could, ha nothing good could come from any of what's going on right now. So I, I don't even know why I bother. Executed every prisoner they captured, and so many hopelessly fought on to the death until their battalions were in tatters and their dead outnumbered their living. By eleven in the morning, the British flag flew over the Chinese battlements. 600 Chinese lay dead, a meager 100 were captured. Among the British, only 30 were wounded, and those not even from enemy fire, but because of their pieces of artillery overheating and exploding. Meanwhile, the Nemesis, the iron steam and sail ship that was being tested in Chinese waters, demonstrated the power of its guns and rockets, dispatching junks and chasing away the Chinese fleet. Three further forts stood to be captured, but the next morning, a Chinese physician came under flag of truce to ask on behalf of Qishan. Despite the overwhelming desire of the troops to cut their way to Canton, Elliot acquiesced. Horrified by the slaughter he had just witnessed, he wrote to one of the British trades who was pushing the war that he hoped to resolve it without further bloodshed, and that if further conflict was necessary, it was clear that they could take what they wanted. So he agreed to meet. Soon, terms were hammered out. The Chinese would pay six million in reparations. The British would pay six million to buy the island of Hong Kong. Ambassadors would be exchanged. The Chinese agreed to not call the British tribute-bearing barbarians anymore. And the British would return all the forts and the territory that they had taken during the war. And most importantly, trade would resume in a much more free and open manner. So, problem solved. Okay. The Chinese get just about the best terms they could conceivably Seems... hope for under the circumstances, and the British get to fulfill their mission and open up a whole new empire for trade. There's been some bloodshed, but in the end, everybody's happy, right? Well, not exactly. No, absolutely Elliot not. Back in England, like... a fellow named Lord Palmerston, who will undoubtedly crop up in other episodes down the line, was not happy. Okay, I'm the gonna British have to remember this then. get the massive sum of money he wanted as reparations for the opium that was destroyed. They didn't get to keep the territory that they'd conquered. They didn't get as many... Op like, it, it's hard to, uh... <laughs> to justify the reparations for something that was clearly, like, an underhanded drug trafficking scheme. But, um... 
I could see how somebody in this time could somehow be so delusional that they could make themselves the victim here. Um, it, it is... Like, he knows that this was an underhanded tactic. Clearly, he, he has to. Open ports as he would like, and perhaps most One would all, think. He was you, you know what? People are, they have unlimited capacity to convince themselves that they're the good guys. So, maybe I shouldn't doubt him in this case. That Elliot, who had never really been comfortable with the drug trade in the first place, didn't even ask that opium be legalized in China. So, Elliot, for his swift and nearly bloodless execution of the war, was dismissed and sent packing. And Qi Shan, the emperor had to be ecstatic with these terms, right? I mean, the Chinese were clearly outmatched, and at the end of the day, all they had had to cede was a barren rock in the middle of the ocean. Pretty good deal, right? Well, the emperor was not so happy. In fact, he immediately... That rock is going to be worth something one day. ...executed for treason. Apparently, he thought they could have gotten a better deal. Uh, don't worry, Qi Shan lived, he's fine, but needless to say, neither party ever signed... I'm pretty sure he died <laughs> so join at us some point. Time ...as all the voices of reason are removed from the Opium War. Oh, great. So Elliot's, Elliot's gonna be gone, um, and that other guy, he's, he seems like he's out of the picture, basically, at this point. So this, I believe, is the last episode, if I'm correct. Sometimes I miss things when I'm putting together my playlist, but I'm almost certain that this is the actual last episode of this one, excluding, of course, the Lies episode. Uh, so, geez, let's, let's do it. I mean, we've gotten this far. Might as well just all the run through it. Voices out of the picture. There are only two ways this conflict can now go. The Chinese can drive the British from their shores and clamp back down on trade with the outside world, or the British can bring this great empire to its knees and force them to trade on their terms. There could be no other resolution. It's completely uncompromising. The Chinese emperor dismissed Qi Shan. He summoned three men to replace him and take over the efforts against the British. One was his nephew, who would serve as the main commander. The other two were officials and military men. So I don't really know the actual power of the Chinese at this point. Um, I don't know if they're, they have like a powerful land force that may be in beneficial, but like as far as naval warfare, you can't really touch the British. But historically, I feel like the Chinese would be used to uh, dealing with naval warfare because of their neighbors, like the Japanese and the... The Koreans both had strong, uh, ha have a history of having pretty strong navies, I do believe. So I'd imagine they have some level of experience dealing with such a thing, but I, the British are kind of on another level. Before they left, one of the officials recommended that they accept peace and let the British busy themselves with trade while they modernized and strengthened the Chinese army. But the emperor would hear of no such thing they would take back what had been lost. Chinese forces now massed around Canton. You want to take back that little rock? He had been trying, with almost no success, to limit the opium that flowed into the now British-controlled port. And the same official who had tried to reason with the emperor now reached out to him, hoping that the large numbers of fresh Chinese troops he brought in would give him more leverage at the bargaining table, and perhaps get Elliot to agree to an even better deal than he'd already offered. But this would not be the case. And so Elliot started concentrating British forces, telling the British and American merchants in Canton to withdraw. By the 22nd of May, 1841, the Chinese were shelling the British factories in town. In the night, they launched fire ships across the river at the becalmed British forces. The great steamship Nemesis fired up its engines, powering out of harm's way. The fire ships missed the rest of the fleet, sailing past and slamming into the port, setting the town on fire. A gun battle took place, but by dawn, the river was firmly in the hands of the British, and the fort mm. guns the Chinese held were silenced. Now it was the British's turn to go on the offensive, but that offensive was halted by a Chinese plea for a truce. Two days later, though, one of the Chinese commanders decided to break the truce. Oh the no. They launched you don't. fire ships to try to destroy the British fleet, but even this would not avail them. In well, you're not getting mercy now. <laughs> You're absolutely not getting mercy at this point. Like, that was clearly a, a, an act of desperation there. But man, like, that's, that's not going to help you later on. 
paid an indemnity to the British to not sack Canton, but riots by the peasants, looting by both the British and Chinese armies, and the complete lack of resolution on the matters of the opium, trade, and Hong Kong issues meant further conflict was inevitable. But as the British withdrew to regroup at Hong Kong, a typhoon hit. The cutter Elliot was on was smashed, leaving him swimming with the flotsam. He began swimming hard for Hong Kong when, over the horizon, he's not gonna make it. Sail. It wasn't a British sail. It was the battened sail of a Chinese war junk. He knew oh, he no. had to swim for his life. Hong Kong was right in front of him. All he had to do was make it. Exhausted, oh, he, he did himself onto the shore, only to be greeted by the news that actually he was fired. He'd been fired oh, no. months ago. It was 1841. Getting news halfway around the world still took a while. And the men who replaced Elliot fair, were far fair. less open to finding common ground with the Chinese. They were here to expand the rights of the British Empire by any means necessary. The war would no longer be interrupted by truces, ceasefires, and talks of peace. And thus the British began on their campaign north and east, capturing fortresses on their way. Each fortress wasn't just a victory in its own right, but a threat to the Emperor in Beijing. Each fallen citadel was another jumping off point that the British now held, ever closer to the Chinese capital. And this time, there would be no returning land. There would be no giving back territory unless all British demands were met. These mm. islands and fortresses... And they have the power to make that happen. ...hostage, not to be relinquished as a sign of good faith or as a part of an agreement to reach a peace, but only in exchange for the ransom the government back in England demanded. As they took these fortresses, though, the British found a strange thing. Everywhere they went, next to the cannon, in the guard towers, they would find opium pipes. The Chinese resistance was weakened by the very drug they were supposed to be fighting against. Oh, all the way okay. Down to the enlisted men, much of the army was addicted to the drug. The British forces, on the other hand, were a mixture of discipline and severity. The new British commanders saw themselves as the civilized force in the conflict and forbade looting on the pain of death, and even And you're and you're fighting a bunch of addicts, so it's a it's a great way to kind of dehumanize them and. Uh... Uh, place yourself above them in another capacity. It's it's only going to further justify their own actions, which is very sad. But naturally, it's soldiers probably what's going to happen. Off captured prisoners' cues for trophies, but when one of their soldiers was kidnapped and beaten during a resupply mission, they had no problem burning several of the nearby villages in retaliation, as if they could train the population through punishment. As the winter of 1841 That's not how it works. Sorry, right, I'm grabbing something. And Chinese attacks became even more desperate. The retaliation simply became more brutal. But their advance pressed on. By the middle of June, Shanghai was taken. And then in July, Xinjiang, where we get a prelude of what's to come with the Manchu commander turning on the Chinese populace, illustrating the cultural and racial divides that would tear China apart over the next 60 years. After securing Xinjiang, the British finally moved... Oh yeah, China today is like... It, it's it's weird Chinese history like it's always called China for like the longest time uh, But it, it's had so many distinct forms that can hardly be considered the same Country it's merely the same national identity and even that that national identity has changed immensely over time And I don't need to know that much about Chinese history to realize that Don to Nanking both sides knew this would be the final showdown the British wouldn't have to seize the capital at Beijing because Nanking stood at the entrance to the Yangtze, the river which was the heart of China. It was the superhighway down which all trade to the capital flowed. If Chinese access to the Yangtze could be cut off, the capital would starve, and much of the kingdom would be in chaos. So it all mm -hmm. came down to this. It all came down to the capture of Nanking. But there would be no great showdown, no final battle, because the Emperor finally began to realize that he was beaten, and that if they lost Nanking, there would be no negotiation, only surrender. So better to negotiate while he still could. Do what you he can, man. official down to talk to the British. At first, talks went nowhere, as the British demanded that the official be given authority to make binding deals for his government, the lack of which the court in Beijing had taken advantage of in prior negotiations to get out of treaties made by other officials. Cultural misunderstandings and attempts to delay as long as possible by the Chinese officials. Any better translators, man. Further, but by the middle of August, under imminent threat of attack on the city, negotiations commenced. In the end, though, despite technically holding Nanking, it was clear who had all the leverage, whose gunboats could impose their will if negotiations failed, and the Chinese ended up conceding on nearly every point. 
the six million that Elliot had asked for now became twenty-one million. Dude, the was granted. A number of new ports for trade were opened up. The old. That's got to be like a national, not just like embarrassment. It's just like emasculating because of how much they saw themselves as like the center of the universe prior to this like how much they thought like they were superior going into this like not only are they losing they're losing big and they can't even really make an argument against it they don't even have that level of leverage that that's devastating Kohong monopoly was abolished, and tariff rates were to be agreed upon rather than set by the sovereign Chinese government. The island of Hong Kong was ceded in perpetuity to the British, and British subjects would operate there under That's how they got it. <laughs> completely free there from we go. Chinese jurisdiction, and British consulates were established at the treaty ports. The only two things that the Chinese didn't concede on were Christian missionaries, which were such a touchy subject that not even the British delegation tried to bring them up, and opium. The Chinese government refused to legalize opium, even though the British representatives mm. tried to lean on them to do so. Even though they had no That's... power to prevent its sale, they steadfastly refused to legalize the drug. This would eventually lead directly to the Second Opium War, a conflict which. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's called the First Opium War. I, for some reason, like I didn't even like think about the concept of a Second Opium War, even though the title clearly implies that. Shocking there is one. Shockingly to the first, at least in the broad strokes, but this time with most of the major colonial powers involved. These two wars, and the treaties which follow them, will go down in Chinese history as the unequal treaties, and begin what will later be labeled by the communist government as the century of humiliation. While at the time they may have seemed just a part of a larger destabilization and realignment of the country as a whole, they have since been seared into the Chinese consciousness, and to this day are conjured whenever dealings with the West take a turn for the worse. Mm. They are used as a milestone, a measuring marker for how far the country has come in the last 150 years, and as propaganda to remind mm. everybody of that fact. And while these wars have perhaps the lowest casualty count of any of the conflicts that extra history has covered to date, they have had a profound impact on global politics and global understanding all the way to today. Really? The Korean wars are long over, but their effects linger in significant ways. See you next time. That was fascinating. I assume they haven't done one of these on the, uh, the second Opium War, but I'm going to check anyway. Uh, but if they have, it might be worth putting on the next poll. Uh, second. Oh, uh, I guess I could just type in opium war. Opium war. Because that would be kind of cool to, I wouldn't follow it this up with. Uh, end of the samurai. No, 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 but no, it does not seem that they have that. So, uh, I guess... We're going in the pretty standard direction when it comes to the future uh, stuff on the channel. What am I doing? I'm trying to find something. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're going in the pretty standard direction following the poll that I did kind of as originally planned. Uh, I'm actually going to pull that up now so we can all take a, a nice little look together at what we're going to be doing over the next four weeks so we've got oh brexit oh geez sorry I'm, I'm looking at stuff that's in my uh recommendations i don't know if i i don't know if i like what i'm seeing um i gotta go to community there it is community tab now make it so that you all can see it there we go um so here's the poll Oh, Joan of Arc got ahead. I didn't even see that. Um, I believe Haitian Revolution was in second place before, but now Joan of Arc is in second place. That's interesting. So for the next four uh, extra history series, we're going to be following the order of like votes in this particular poll. So next week, assuming Haitian Revolution doesn't come back, we're going to be doing Joan of Arc. Then we'll do Haitian Revolution. But then we have Battle of Kursk and Kosovo, which are uh, unfortunately both in fourth place, which I don't know what to do with. 
it doesn't give me an exact number of votes here so i'm just stuck with this eight percent can somebody just if anybody hasn't voted can you just vote for something to put one over the other uh because it'll make that easier if not I'll, I'll do like a coin flip or something i'll do a a digital coin flip and uh we'll be able to see what we do uh yeah so that was cool